Dan Purvis with Purvis Bees and today I'm going to show you how to do what we call micro scale queen production. This is Steve and Karen Hinch and they very generously offered to give me some equipment to use for training purposes for this video. And hopefully at the end of this day you'll be able to learn how to produce your own queens instead of buy inferior queens from queen producers that don't really know how to produce them. Yeah, Steve's a beekeeper and he's been maintaining bees say five years now yeah and this time he hasn't requeened them and he's doing it all natural and my my hat if I had one on would be <laughs> off to you and I, that's what we need to do we need more beekeepers like Steve and Karen I want to apologize for getting this video out late um, I told you I was going to have it out right around March 15th I was not able to get it out then I just couldn't get traction on it I wasn't sure what was going on I just knew I didn't like it and if you know anything about our queens, I'm not going to sell you something I'm not happy with. I normally get things out on time, but this time I didn't. And instead of sending you something I wasn't happy with, we decided to go ahead and wait until I was happy with it. I did find out why I wasn't happy. And it was because I was not able, I finally realized that I was not uh, explaining something right off the beginning. Now, I don't know why I couldn't see that, but I realized finally that I'm a whole lot better beekeeper than I am a video maker or a teacher. And I, I want to take the time also to apologize very specifically to some of the teachers and professors that, that I did not have as much respect for before I started teaching and doing videos now that I do. Uh, but those guys uh, and gals, uh, I have a whole lot more respect for now. and. Uh, Beekeeping's a whole lot easier in my opinion. Um, but anyway, having said that, what I want to explain to you now is with this video, when you get into it and you look at it, you're going to see where I'm jumping into is a queenless colony. So as a beginning beekeeper or as a beekeeper, what you're, what you're seeing me do is you, you, you're seeing me going right into a colony that has been dequeened or a colony that is queenless. So imagine you went into your yard and you've taken out a queen and this colony is queenless and that's where we pick up from. Now as a beginning beekeeper, you're probably saying, well, what did you do with the queen? Well, there's all kinds of things you could have done with it. You could have killed the queen, let's say that you didn't want it, but since you probably want to start with a really strong colony, you may not have wanted to kill that queen. You can take that queen and put it in a cage, put six, seven, eight, uh, attendant bees with it and some queen candy or you could have made uh, one frame nuke with it you don't want to take a whole bunch of frames with it maybe or maybe you do want to take some of your um, wet brood which is your uh, uncapped brood with it and remove that you can make a two uh, frame nuke or maybe even a three frame nuke with it and that you can look that up and get uh, some information on how to do that um, or just get the queen out of there. You want to make it a queenless colony. Um, and, and, but the bottom line is you want this thing queenless and that's what we're jumping into on this video. Um, also, what I'm calling this is micro scale queen rearing and mainly I'm trying to get the focus on my technique of fine tuning something that's been going on for years in beekeeping. Uh, don't get caught up in um, pole vaulting over piss ants over this. This thing is not a new thing. Beekeepers have been doing this from the very beginning since people have been keeping bees. In fact, uh, commercial beekeepers, if they ever get in a big pinch for time, will we'll do this. When we were keeping large numbers of bees and I, and I was in a real pinch for time, I can remember times um, where if I had 50 hives in a yard and they were strong doubles, i just go out there and break them in two. Put one on top of another hive, hang, it, hang that top hive over the back end of the other, come back 30 days later and see what, you know, which one will queen right and straighten them out from there. Sometimes you have to do that if you're in a real pinch for time. Um, that's not the preferred method, but sometimes you have to do that. Um, so like I said, don't get caught up in Pole vaulting over piss ants, that's a favorite phrase of mine. You, you, can, you can find 
techniques or little things in this video that might help your operation out if you're an experienced or seasoned beekeeper and if you're a beginner you can use this exact technique and really develop or produce your good quality queens I promise you you can get some good queens out of this technique if you've got any questions with this video or you see a problem with it maybe I didn't explain myself too well please this is a work in progress like I said I'm not a, a seasoned teacher here I'm trying to get better at it Help me out here. We'll make this thing better. This is a free video. I want to make it better for everybody who's using it. Let's, let's, let's make it a work in progress for everybody. Feed me some emails, texts, call me, whatever, and we'll make this thing a better thing for everybody, and I'll make the changes. I'll try not to make it three months next time, and uh, I hope you like it, and I hope it works for you. I hope it does something for you. Until next time, Dan Purvis, enjoy the video. Thank you. Why would you want to produce your own queens? Well, first of all, it's economic reasons. If, if you are paying $26 a hive for a new queen, um, that gets expensive if you got 50 colonies or so. And even if you got one or two, that's still pretty expensive. You don't have any possible damage from the queens being shipped or handled. Um, and you get a little bit more control in what the queens are, or how the queens are being produced. It's very important that everybody try to produce their own queens because the maintenance of a wide genetic diversity. And the thing that's happening nowadays is a lot of the commercial produced queens are produced from a very small gene pool. Uh, it's been estimated that 85% of all the queens that are produced every year come from less than 200 breeder queens. Now, if you know anything about queen genetics, you know that the loss of the sex allele count is very bad. But it's not just the loss of the sex allele count. It's also the loss of the superfamily structure, which can support all the different pressures that come from the beehive over a year's period of time. Things like pollen collection, a nectar collection, um, some that are more defensive, some that are less defensive virus resistance, all those things combine into this super organism I like to call it, the hive. And the more genetic diversity you have, the bigger team you have, the bigger toolbox you have, the more safe or the safer this hive is going to be and, it, and therefore you're going to see more survival that way. So what I'm saying is survival is important, genetic diversity is key to that. And what's key to genetic diversity is having everybody, whether they got two hives or a thousand hives, producing at least some of their own queen. It's a very nice uh, feeling to know that you took that queen from the very beginning, from an egg, all the way up, and now you're harvesting honey from it. Right about the time the blackberry's blooming is the best time to try to produce your own queens. And also, unfortunately, that's usually after um, the honey flow started. So a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to produce my own queens during the honey flow, but believe it or not, you can produce your own queens and still produce a honey crop during the honey flow. What we're going to show you here, uh, two frames of pollen, two frames of wet brood, which by the way, wet brood is it's basically uncapped brood. You might have two frames, you might have four frames. That's not something you need to get hung up on. Then I've got honey. I'm just trying to basically model what you might see in a hive. Of course, your honey and your pollen is normally on the outside. What you do when you try to produce your own queens without grafting, which is something that we're doing with microscale queen production, you're not doing any grafting here. We move the pollen frames from the outside towards the inside. Okay. So here's what we've got. This frame here, this is a marked with an X on top. That frame is going to be the frame that we're producing our queen cells on. And what we do is everybody who's worked bees for more than a couple hives has probably seen a frame of eggs that is just starting to hatch out and it's just starting to get milky in one little spot and it's starting to bloom and there's eggs all the way around that one spot where they're hatching out. 
coming from a hive that you want to propagate. In other words, it's a good, healthy hive. Um, it's got genetic diversity, at least you think it is. Uh, showing some disease resistance, whatever you're selecting for. You pull a frame of eggs, like I just described, out of that hive. You shake all the bees off of it. You can shake this frame because you're not going to be grafting from it. You can shake the bees off of it. Make sure the queen's not in it. And you can bring it over and put it in the center of this hive that you're going to be grafting from. Now, let me back up. Not grafting from, but producing your queens in. So you can do that all at the same time. I found the queen. I've caged her. I moved her. Whatever I've done, she's no longer, this is not queen right. And I'm not going to go into details on why you do that, but this is what we've got. A queenless colony full of bees with this frame here coming from the outside. That's the only thing that's coming from the outside. Unless you wanted to add bees to this colony. These two frames here, the next frame sitting right next to it. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to just pull everything out. Find your two frames of pollen. We'll start with that. And you create your gap. Your gap is in between the two frames of pollen. And that's where you're going to put this frame of eggs that I've just described earlier. Eggs and just start to hatch out right in the center. You mark it with an X, either with your hive tool or a Sharpie. And you know where it's at. Then you put your two frames, of, you, you move your two frames of pollen right next to it. And the next thing I like to do, if you've got any wet brood or uncapped brood, which you'd want to try to avoid that in this situation because you want all the nurse bees to be focused on this frame. Nurse bees are the bees that feed the queen uh, larva, the queen cells. But it's really hard sometimes to remove all the wet brood. You don't have no place to put it. So the best thing to do is put that on the outside of the pollen. You could put it right next to this frame, but I don't like doing that. I want this, this frame here right next to the pollen, both of them, so that they're surrounded with a food source. They're surrounded with honey which is the carbohydrate. They're surrounded with essential fatty acid, which is in your pollen, and also the uh, protein, which is your pollen. So you got your wet brood coming on the outside of your two pollen frames. So what we have here, pollen, in the frame that you want to breed from, or you want to produce your queens from, your queen cells. Then, if you got your honey frames, put them on the outside, all the way to the outside. And I like to do that for two or three different reasons. If you've got uncapped frames of honey, that it causes the bees to move that honey around. And, if, and there's a phenomenon that I've noticed that makes them think that when they're doing that, it's, it'll even, it's like simulating a flow, even during a flow. I like to have it that way. And on top of that, when you're down in the south or you're in real intense heat, this these full frames of honey on the outside act as a thermal mass. It, it makes everything more stable. And you want that on the outside. Don't worry about it having it right up next to the, uh, the frame that you're producing the queen cells. The pollen is the most important thing. Cat brood on the outside of your wet brood, if you've got any. Preferably, you have 100% cat brood. Or, if you really want to spice it up and you've got the hives, you don't have anything in here except a lot of nurse bees, honey, and pollen, and that one frame. In this particular scenario, we've got two, three frames of capped brood, two frames of honey, two frames of wet brood, two frames of pollen, and the frame that we're grafting for, or we're producing queen cells from. Now, keep in mind, this is queenless. It's full of nurse bees. There's ways that you can produce... Uh, or make sure that you have more nurse bees than normal. Um, you, for one, you can go to other hives and find wet brood. That's where your nurse bees are gonna be. Make sure you know where the queen's at and bring that back and shake those bees off into this scenario here.
Don't worry about them beat, beating each other up and killing each other. That's way overrated and it'll, you don't need to worry about it, especially during a flow. Just take those bees, shake those nurse bees off. They're not going to kill the nurse bees. So you'll have a few deaths, but it's very minor. Shake as many nurse bees in there as you can afford from the other hives if you really want to beef this thing up. Now, you also want to feed this, this setup. Now, you didn't notice, but I did not put an internal free feeder in these things. Where I'm from, small high beetle is very big problem, can be. Anytime you get a lot of heat and a lot of humidity, you're going to have a lot of small high beetles. And don't think for a second that you don't have small high beetles because you only seen one. If you've seen one, you can promise yourself if you've got a whole lot more than that, you just don't know it yet. Um, I like dry feeders. Now what is a dry feeder, and I'm getting off subject here, but a dry feeder will feed sort of like on demand. It's a vacuum feeder instead of an open exposed syrup uh, location. So you won't see those kind of open in frame feeders, frame feeders um, in any of my feeding situations. I like bucket feeders or boardman feeders. Um, the bees come in and, and suck the nectar through the proboscis uh, through the bottom of their of the feeder in the bucket. Four days later, you come back. Now you might ask yourself, why four days? You want these four days um, to give this frame enough time for all those eggs that were in here to hatch out. Okay. Now let's pretend this is full of bees and it's four days later. Here's what I do. I come in and I start from the outside. I scoot everything over, give it a good puff, scoot it over. Don't jar everything. You don't need to do that. Come in there and I'll shake these off a little bit. And that's a, a technique that you need to learn how to shake bees properly without killing everything or shaking your hive all up. You don't want to do it up here because inevitably you get in the habit of doing that the queen is the last bee off of the frame and she always does this when she's full of eggs. Deep grass, you never see her again. So, take it from experience. Shake them down in here, get this frame, put it out to the side, and pop these loose, bring them out. Now, what you're doing here with even one of these frames is you're looking for cells. Here's where it's important. You want to check this thing closely. If it even looks like a cell, kill it. Because here's the thing. You can have a three-day-old larva. That means it's from the time it was laid, it's six, seven days old. From the time beginning when it was laid to the time it, at that point. But the problem with the older larva, sure, they, the queens come out quicker, but the ovaries are smaller, and it's a lower-quality queen. And the cells will be smaller, usually. Um, so if it even looks like a queen cell, it may look like a drone cell, I kill it. All of these things I smash on all frames except for this frame here. So I go through here, shaking the bees off, I'm looking, get a look from the bottom to see if there's any royal jelly, that's an identifier. You may have some that's capped by this time, believe it or not. Old larvae gets capped early, there's not the queens you want, those are rogue queens, kill them. You're going through every one of them, including this first frame. Shaking the bees off. There's one. Kill it. I find a whole bunch of them in here. Oh yeah, there's a bunch of them. Just kill them. Don't worry about it. Just kill them. Okay. Now you get down to this final one. Check your pollen frames too, believe it or not. You find some in that. If it looks like it, it could be a queen, kill it. You get to this one. I don't like using those hard words, kill, but I don't know a better one destroy it. How's that? Pull, pull this thing out. Now, you don't want to shake the bees off of this, okay? You don't want to 
handled as roughly as I'm handling it now, so I better just show you how I would do this. Okay, I come to this frame and I pull this frame away from that. I pop it and gently pull it out. Now, anybody who's been keeping bees for a while knows this secret. Just blow out. It'll make them run. It'll get them off of the area. You don't want to brush it. You don't want to pound it. You don't want to turn it over too much at that time. You can dislodge the larva from the royal bed jelly and it'll destroy that queen cell. What you're looking for at this point are two queen cells. And preferably, in a perfect world, you want them right in this area. And you want them side by side on the same side. Now why would you do that? The first queen that hatches out is the one that kills the older, the younger queen, but they're so close in age at this point it doesn't matter. And the way a good healthy queen will lay anyway, she lays like this. So they're almost identical in age. They may come out at the same time, but I don't want a whole lot of queens in there fighting and tussling around killing each other or damaging each other. Now why do you keep two? Redundancy. Your percentages will go up on this colony being requeened when you have two queen cells in there. And some say, well, if you two will do it, why not leave three? Believe it or not, I found that it does cause problems when you have more than two cells. Lots of times you'll have follow-on swarms. For some reason, you'll have a swarming situation where they just start swarming a whole lot. They won't kill all the queens. And that can still happen with two cells, but I found through experience when we have done this kind of thing and taught it, that two cells works great. Just And, and plus when we nuke, when we sell our many nukes, we run 1,800 many nukes, we would put two cells in each many nuke and our percentages went up about five to seven percent. I have to look at the numbers again. And that's profitable, you wanna do that. So two cells, all these queen cells except for two. I know where they're at. I stick this thing back in there. I pull this pollen frame out. I check it out. I look for cells. Kill them. Put it back in. Push it in here. Do the same thing. Now I want to go through this without talking because I. It's hard. I'm a beekeeper. I'm not a professional presenter, but I want to try to teach you what I know because it's valuable stuff. I, I pay dearly for that, some of this. I want to show you how I would work this, and I'm going to imagine in my mind the bees being in it. And I'm not going to talk you through it. I'm going to focus on what I'm doing, okay? This is my imaginary smoker. Puff, puff. Okay, you get the point. That's how fast you move through this. When I first started, and, and new beekeepers, they, a lot of them don't understand just little things like how you hold a hive tool, where you keep it, basic habits that need to be developed from the beginning. Otherwise, you're going to be breaking these habits for years to come. And they, lots of times they don't know how long they're supposed to be in a hive. They don't know how they're supposed to handle them. If you've seen a commercial beekeeper use bees, I work bees, you'd be amazed. It'll scare you. It did me when I first saw it way back, and we evolved the same way. When you're working a thousand colonies, you ain't got time to go through them like you've got five. If you've got the time, take it. But you can do what I just did and produce good quality queens. We've identified our two cells. They're good to go. We just close this thing back up, make sure the feed's in it, and walk away from it. Now, the question is, when do we get back into it?
you want to start from the outside and work in. If you want to come back in and check it again, more often you can do that. You can have one high that you can do that with. You can do it with a couple of them. Now the numbers that you're going to see in something like this is going to be somewhere around 65% at minimum. Sometimes you can see up to 95% yield. And what I mean by that is six, six out of ten times that you do this, you're going to get a decent quality queen. There's several contentious points in this, one being um, killing all the queen cells except the youngest. I know there's a, a man that was a very respected queen producer in the past, uh, John Jay I think his name was, that says that you can't do that, or it didn't matter, you didn't need to do that. I disagree. I've raised thousands and thousands of queens and I can tell you right now, a queen produced from a younger larva is a better quality queen. And there's a reason for that. It has to do with the number of ovarolas per ovary and there's more of them produced when you use a younger queen or a younger larva and nothing's younger than an egg. So my opinion on using eggs, trying to identify and use the eggs by killing all the older cells is valid. And this gives you the basic building block on how you can produce a queen per hive. I hope you got something out of this and I thank you very much. Until next time, Stan Purvis with Purvis Bees.